Jeff, welcome to the show. Uh, glad to have you, buddy. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, there's so much I feel like I could talk to you about. Um, <laughs> yeah, the, the conversation could just go so many different ways. So I'll try to keep everything on track. Uh, you and I have so many, um, I feel like, aligned interests. And um, we've talked so many times over the last few years about all that. Um, but let's start, I'd like to start the conversation with kind of your early career track. Um, when were you kind of first introduced to the concept of work? <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I started working when I was, I think, 15 or 16. And uh, I was at, just in high school, didn't have a lot of money. Um, well, I'm sorry, my, my mom, my stepdad, I feel like they had a lot of money. I was living in California, but I feel like I, that transfer of wealth wasn't happening and just got kind of fed up. I'm like, all right, I'm going to start just making money on my own. And so I just started, uh, actually the very first job I ever had was helping some lady in a home-based business, folding cat towels and putting them in these packages that they would just hang on shelves. Um, and I love when I share that story because people are like, cat towels? I'm like, I don't even know what that means. But yeah, like it, it was a thing. I mean, I don't know if it's still a thing, but it was back then. And uh, that began the journey of just working. And even in high school, I was working about 20 hours a week while I was, you know, full-time student. And at different times in my life, I've had two jobs, a full-time and a part-time job. Also was in the Army National Guard uh, on top of that. And always just been really busy with my time. But I really started to learn, I guess, just the basics of working for money. I uh, didn't really understand like entrepreneurship and any of that until much later on. But yeah, I was very much like hard work, show up, you know, give your best. Uh, and that was just what I did. At Towels. I, I haven't heard that story before. That's really funny. Um, and it, it's what's even funnier, I guess, for me that because I've known you for a little while is <laughs> you were working in a home-based business <laughs> right from the get-go. Uh, yeah. which which is kind of another little funny twist to that story. That's fantastic. Complete full circle working at home now. Uh, we don't have cats, we have dogs and we don't have dog towels, but yeah, completely full circle. <laughs> Excellent. Um, how did you end up in the, arm, the, the, the military branches? What, what led you into that world? Yeah, so that was at a very, very low point in my life. I graduated high school had uh, got denied. I was living in LA, UCLA denied me and was going to go to community college and end up registering late and all, got dropped all my classes. And so I was a college dropout going nowhere in life. My mom got me a job doing data entry at her corporate job or whatever, her company. And I mean, data entry. I mean, for those that are younger, you probably don't, don't know what that means, but I could operate a 10 key like I was a, like a ninja. And I mean, for eight hours a day, I was entering in numbers into Excel spreadsheets. And I am not exaggerating. It was hell. <laughs> it was absolute hell. And just still live with my mom. We were not getting along and got into, uh, started doing drugs and just not, just not going anywhere. And I remember a good friend of mine, actually one of my best friends at the time, sent me an email. He was from the Midwest. And I just remember reading this email because basically in this email, he shared his concern for me, you know, because like I had really big ambitions. All of a sudden now, like I'm, I'm not going to school, I'm doing drugs. And he was just worried about me. And I remember I read that email and I, I read it and I was, I was high when I read it. And I just thought, oh my gosh, like I needed it. And that's when I decided I needed a kick in the butt. And I decided to join the Army National Guard. I had some friends back in the Midwest. The, the guy who emailed me actually was in the Marines. Um, I had some other friends had joined the Guard. And my dad also was in, he was an Army, uh, what do you call it, 101st Airborne. So he jumped out of airplanes back in the day. And it's like, okay, that's, that's what I needed. I needed a, a kick in the butt, get some discipline. Um, also, like, <laughs> once again, I was living with my mom. We weren't getting along. She didn't want me to join, which was even more 
uh, ammunition that I needed, you know, like incentive, like, oh, you don't want me to join? Okay, yeah, I'll join. And there was like some financial bonuses because I ended up joining the infantry, which was like the hardest, most dangerous. Of course, I'm going to join that one. And that's what initially led to me joining to uh, basically take charge of my life, get some money and also pay for school, which was the, uh, the other motiv- motivating factor. You said you had um, a lot of ambitions. Um, what, what, what were some of those? And what, I mean, do you just kind of recall like the thoughts you had about life and where you would be uh, or end up, you know, prior to joining the military? Yeah, I just, I just, I remember having, living in the Midwest in like small town, Illinois. Uh, my, I was born in LA though. So my mom lived in LA. So I was, I got to see big city life. And every time I went back to Illinois, I was like, wow. I mean, it was like so many years behind. So just like being able to kind of like see into the future almost, you know, like, oh, this is how, how the world's going to be um, back here. And because of that, I, I don't really know what it meant. I just always felt like there was something bigger for me, you know, something that was non-traditional, but like, I didn't really spend a lot of time doing research into like careers and jobs and all that stuff. I just had these ambitions, I guess, of being successful, even though I couldn't define it. Um, and that's, I just, yeah, that's just what I felt. Didn't know what it was exactly, but definitely dropping out of school was not part of that plan. Yeah, I, I recall um, having something similar. Uh, you know, I didn't drop out and I didn't, <laughs> certainly didn't end up in the military, but I, I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I had this thought that, okay, in the future, I'm going to do some interesting things and, you know, be quote unquote successful. And I just remember having a conversation with my dad. He was like, what are you going to do? You know, this is like college. Like what, like, have you literally thought any steps ahead? What are you going to do? And I said, honestly, I don't know what I'm going to do, but I'm pretty, pretty sure I'm going to do multiple different things. And I'm going to, you know, string, string something together. Like that was basically all I could say. Um, and I feel like I've sort of run that path and, and you've run that path as well in terms of getting the help that you needed at the time you need it, um, getting something out of it. And then, you know, eventually moving on to, uh, to bigger and better things. Um, so it's, it's really, it's really kind of interesting when you, when you got done, um, with your, because you, you were in Iraq, you were, you actually deployed in Iraq, correct? Mm-hmm. And you became a, you ended up becoming a certified financial planner. Is that, is that after or concurrent with some of your time? Uh, yeah. The- so Army National Guard, you go to basic training, just like regular army, you come back and then basically you do your one week in a month, uh, two weeks in the summer. And my initial obligation was for six years. So I joined, I ended up you know, going through college, graduating college, got an internship at an investment firm while I was in college that ended up leading to me becoming a financial advisor, uh, getting a job offer. So I'm doing the guard, you know, doing the internship, get hired. And I fulfilled that six year obligation within, I, gosh, I'm trying to think like a year or two of me becoming a, an advisor. But uh, after the six years came up, I, I did what a lot of people didn't do uh, that joined <laughs> was I re-enlisted for another three years, all my other friends that did their six, they got out, you know, they got their schooling paid for, they, they got what they needed. I re-enlisted. And the reason I did was because this is what I told myself, like I went to work, I was wearing a shirt and a tie. I didn't, ha- I didn't, we lived in the Midwest, so you didn't have to wear a jacket there. Right. But I did wear a shirt and tie. And for me, like that one week in a month where I could go out into the field and just be a man and get dirty and just, you know, like it just, it was a nice break from showing up to the office, you know, behind a computer. So it was like, I, I, I enjoyed that camaraderie of hanging out with these guys and telling the same stupid jokes like month after month. But anyway, uh, I think it was nine months or so into that re-enlistment is whenever we end up getting notified that we're being deployed. So that's when uh, I ended up finding out being deployed. I was in Iraq for 17 months. So I was a financial planner for about two and a half years before I was deployed. 
was gone, came back, they held a position for me, um, took over that, you know, the clients and all that when I came back. And then it was about a year after that is when I obtained that uh, my CFP designation. Okay, so it was really mid career, you had kind of started to build, build a book, and then yeah. you ended up going, um, going, over yeah, it was like, really, timing wise, it sucked. Because for those that don't know the financial to, to become a financial advisor, I mean, I had a training class that I went through up in uh, the home office up in St. Louis, and there was like 55 of us in this training class. After a year, over half of them had already phased out, fizzled out, just did not make it. And within like, I think it was five years after, it's the same stats you look at like starting a small business, right? Probably worse. Um, But I remember like after five years, there was only like five or six of us left from that original training class. So made it through that first year, didn't make a lot of money. And after that second year, like all of a sudden, like I just felt that momentum like starting, you know, because after you do a bunch of seminars and you start meeting a bunch of people and getting your name out there and shaking hands, all of a sudden now opportunities start coming to you because you survived. Um, So I I was getting like newer clients, bigger clients, and then all of a sudden, whack. (laughs) Now you gotta like, and not, it wasn't just 17 months, you know, it was like that 93 months before I left, like who's going to like start investing with somebody who's getting ready to deploy to a, a combat zone, right? Like, so I didn't get a bunch of new clients before I left. Plus I'm like, what's the point? You know, like, do I really want to sit in my office for the next, you know, I did for some of that, but other times I'm just like, dude, I just need to spend some time with family and friends before I leave. And then coming back, you know, you have a transition of, oh, I'm not in a Humvee in 140 degree, 140 degree weather, scared that a roadside bomb is going to take my life. You know, I'm back wearing a shirt and tie again. And so there was like a transition of me just getting back to normal. Uh, so it was almost like a two year break, you know, in between. Um, but yeah, it, it, it took a little while to get back into it. But once I did, yeah, that's when it just, it started to take off. Um, so a couple of follow-up questions. One is deciding to become a financial advisor. How did that process happen for you? Was that, uh, was that simply, <laughs> I was looking for something and it caught me at the right time? Or, or was that something that you consciously wanted to do? Yeah, no, absolutely not. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, after, I guess at some point, I knew that I was going to major in business. So when I started getting my associate's degree, and a lot of that was because of my stepdad, who I actually did not like at all. But one of the, I guess I liked him a little bit. He, he was the guy back in the 80s who had the car phone, which was like the bag phone that you would plug into your cigarette lighter. And for those that have no idea what I'm talking about, like that, that was like a cool thing. Like not a lot of people had that. And he always had, like he had this thing called the Butler, which is basically the equivalent of like your Amazon Echo, you know, where you say, hey, Butler, turn on the lights. Like this is going back in the eighties. Like the thing never worked. I mean, it was a piece of crap, but you know, he spent a lot of money on these types of things. And, you know, he would go to work wearing a suit and cufflinks and just had that part. So because of that, and knowing that my real dad didn't graduate college until he was like 55, always struggled with money, like really had like that whole rich dad, poor dad experience, you know, like, which like looking back was like truly a blessing. So looking at my real, or oh, sorry, my stepdad, I'm like, okay, I don't know what he does. I just know, I know he's involved in business. So I knew I was going to be a business major. And then from there I started, I didn't really know where to specify. So it was between finance or accounting and it almost went towards accounting. Thank God I didn't. Uh, it's actually my real dad who, when I was asking him, like, what do you think? He's like, well, I know that I've never met an accountant with a good personality. So I think you should choose finance. And I'm like, okay. So that's what I chose finance as my major. And from there, I was thinking corporate finance, like doing the corporate ladder. And that's actually where I thought I was going. And going back, this is a 2002 when I graduated college. And for those that don't remember, like this is a whole like the, the dot com era, you had 9-11 also going on. And uh, the company that I was interviewed for, which I ended up being a broker for, but as far as the corporate office goes, they ended up having like their first layoff, like in 117 year history, the year I graduated college. And I'd interned at this local investment firm. I had 
uh, which included me filing and shredding, you know, all the, all the necessary tasks as an intern. But I also ended up doing some cold calling for one of the brokers, one of the financial advisors there and actually landed him a few clients doing that. I hated it, but I, I did, I was okay at it. And he had made me a job offer as a junior broker, which I declined <laughs> initially. And then when everything dried up in the job market, I'm like, okay, well, I guess I'll do that then. <laughs> and that's how I stumbled upon becoming a financial advisor. Yeah, it was a very difficult time to get a job, especially right out of college um, during that time. I, re I remember it very well. Um, so I was going to ask about the, if it wasn't necessarily like your life's calling, right? You didn't, you didn't know that this was going to be your life's calling or what you were going to do. What were the, and you alluded to it just, just now, what were some of the skills or things that you may have been naturally good at that aligned with, uh, with this type of job? Cause it's not for everybody. It's, it, and it can be very difficult. Nose to the grindstone type of work. Yeah, I, one of the things I, I didn't realize I kind of had prepped myself for this job was in college. I had, I mean, a few jobs that weren't that great, but the one that I, I think I ended up having the longest was I worked at GNC, the, the vitamin store. And when I worked there, they had, um, uh, I mean, we'll call it commissions. I forgot their term, but you know, if, if somebody bought a gold card, you know, you get $2. If they bought like a five pound tub of protein, you get like three to $5. And I was super motivated, but not like into like a, a I want to try to sell you as much as I can. You know, when somebody would come in and they're interested in either gaining weight or losing weight, you know, I would start asking questions like, well, what are you currently doing? Like, what are you working out? Like, what are you eating? And like, well, do you, how much protein do you get? So like, I took this whole like consultant approach, which I, no one ever trained me in this crap. I don't know how I even figured this out. But because of that, when minimum wage back then was like 475, I was making like almost like 10 bucks an hour. And it was this being curious, asking a lot of questions, being able to identify, you know, with these people. Then by that, by the time, like I took these time with them, I earned their trust. So they were more likely to buy from me and being a financial advisor at first, I didn't realize it was similar. Like I thought like, oh, people want to know about standard deviation uh, and <laughs> all these stupid financial terms. No one cared about that stuff. All they wanted to know was one, did I know what I was talking about? Or was I some snake oil salesman that was trying to like just rip them off? Um, and also like, did they trust me? And that took me asking a lot of questions, getting to know their situation, doing a lot of comprehensive financial planning before I was even a CFP. And like, these are all things I had to do because I was 20 some years old. And most of the clients that I was trying to earn their business was a minimum two to three times my age. So it's like, okay, I've been working my entire life. You know, here's my entire life savings. Do I want to give it to this kid? <laughs> And run the risk of like him losing it all. And I mean, that was like what the battle that I had to face, but uh, I, I was up for it, you know, so I was definitely the, just the way I presented myself was um, much more mature, I guess, than I probably was at the time. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, it, that's who I was underneath. And that's what worked out. Yeah, I mean, I think those skills you probably learned later were classified as sales skills <laughs> absolutely uh, to put them in a bucket right like we i we all think of okay what are what are sales skills and you know, i don't maybe want to be a salesman it, sometimes it gets a bad connotation but uh to, to your the point of your entire story is it's really more so about being inquisitive and consultative and asking questions and make and helping people uh be at ease with you and addressing their concerns than it is, you know, trying to squeeze a, a you know, a, a circle into a, into a square or whatever it, it might be. Um, so it sound, sounds like you were kind of just naturally geared to that. And that was something that you really um, learned as you went in, instead of knowing this is my strength and finding a job, like, you know, everybody wants to have a plan out of college of what to do. Uh, so take a strengths finders test and then go after these types of things. Like your, your, yours, yours was kind of in, in reverse of, of that, you know, quote unquote 
uh, guidance, which I, which I love. I mean, I think that's, that's phenomenal. Yeah, I, I remember like one of the first bigger clients that I got, and I just remember being on the phone with him. Like it was a straight cold call. And this is probably like the fourth time I called him. And he asked me a question that I did not know the answer to. And, and I don't know who, who told me this. I mean, somebody, I guess, gave me some, a really good life lesson here. But this is one of those times where I could have BS my way through it. But instead, I said, you know, I don't know the answer to that, but I will find out. And I'll give you a call back as soon as I, I, I know. And I did that. And the only reason I bring that up is because when he ended up becoming a client, he's like, listen, one of the reasons I, I chose you, because you are young, but I really respect the fact that you admitted that you didn't know the answer, but you were willing to find out. And I was like, oh, really? Okay, that's cool. <laughs> like it was just somehow it was wired in me, uh, kind of golden rule type, you know, lessons, I guess, from my grandmother or somebody, you know, somebody important in my life. And being willing to admit, man, I don't, I don't have all the answers, but I'll find out for you. Like I'll, I'll do what it takes to get that answer for you. So that worked out really well. Yeah. We don't get a lot of that in society today. Like everybody's supposed to project themselves as an expert, right. And, and mm -hmm. supposed to know everything. Um, but you kind of find like when you have some experience, you know, you and I have been uh, in our careers for, for a minute. <laughs> um, one of the things that I've, I've, I've found out like over the years is, the bar is actually set pretty low. And if you just do the X's and O's, the blocking and tackling, right? Like that we would say that just the little things, um, you find yourself in some pretty opportune uh, places. And I think that's, I don't know if that's part of imposter syndrome that gets wired into us or what it is, but it's just amazing how I've seen that manifest over and over again. It's like, you just do the little things and you actually stand out among the crowd. It, it is crazy. You know, and the little thing is like sending up a follow-up email. Right. You know, or, or, oh my gosh, a handwritten letter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like yeah. this is just not in people's like vocabulary and they just don't do it. But yeah, it's those simple things that make you stand out. Yeah. Well, cool. Uh, so I want to get to, on a, so you, you get back from deployment, you're back at it hitting the grind, building your practice. And as you're growing that, um, and, and if, if I skip over some steps or something like that, that you, you think are important, please, please rein me in. But one of the things that you end up doing uh, to grow your practice is you just start writing online. So talk to me a little bit about how that came to be and why you started doing that and what you saw from it. Yeah, one, one of the... I guess we'll call it like one of the uh, uh, unknown consequences or um, uh, byproducts of so the, the firm that I was working for ended up selling. Uh, they ended up being bought out, which ended up becoming Wells Fargo. And when that happened, I, I didn't, I wasn't, I didn't want to be a part of a big bank. I just didn't have a good vibe about it. So me and three other guys, we ended up leaving and we co-founded our own investment firm. And so now I, and for those that don't know, like I was a W2 employee with the first firm that I was at, even though they treated me as like a, an entrepreneur, like, I mean, I did make my own sales, but I still had to give them a large cut. So when I left, I became a 1099 con, you know, independent contractor, small business owner for the first time. And I went on what was called more the independent side instead of having like a big name behind us, like a Merrill Lynch or a Morgan Stanley, you know, we got to brand ourselves as more like the local level. And when I started doing this, I started doing a bunch of research of like, okay, how can I stand out? You know, like I looked at it as like a, a way that I could market myself differently than every other advisor out there. And there was a couple of things I tried. Like I, I paid a lot of money for these really fancy brochures that really didn't do a dang thing. That was a lot of money. Um, and then I stumbled upon this, article in this trade magazine, like financial advisor magazine that talked about how if you really want to stand out from the competition, you need to start a blog. And I read this article, it's like a one page article. I'm like, yeah, like that's what I'm going to do. What's a blog? <laughs> and for those like this is going back, I think 2007 is when I read the article. Um, at that time, I am not on Facebook, do not have my my space Twitter. I I forgot when Twitter came out, but I was not, I was not on social media. I didn't even really like being on a computer all that much. But when I finally 
like I went to the, the, the advisor's blog that was mentioned in this article. Then I did a quick search for certified financial planner blogs. And I remember when I did that search, I was like, oh, yeah, because what I found was pretty much nothing. Like there was maybe four or five financial planner blogs in the entire country going back to 2007, 2008. And if you've not heard this expression before, you know, like, you need to find your niche, you need to find your niche. And I'm like, did I just find something like I, and so when I, when I went to the four or five that were out there, just seeing what they had, and then I, that's when I really stumbled upon financial blogs in general. And I was like, my mind was blown. Like, wow, because I've been doing seminars. I've been doing, uh, I was like doing like this investment class, like a local park district. Um, you know, I was doing all these stuff at the local level. And all of a sudden, like I saw this, this blog as this potential to reach hundreds, <laughs> maybe thousands of people. So that's when I got really excited and ended up registering the domain Good Financial Sense. And uh, for about nine months, I was writing articles, researching blogging and search engine optimization and all this stuff, because this was all foreign to me. And nine months of like investing a lot of time, uh, I finally ended up getting my first client out of it. And the cool thing about that was I didn't know what I was doing, man. I had no, no clue. And for a long time, my wife was like, what are you doing? Like, you're wasting a lot of time on this. And I mean, and I started to believe it because like, I didn't really know what I was doing. Didn't have really any success from it. And finally got the first client who found me because she had typed in a keyword that I really had focused on, which was like financial planner, Illinois. And at that time, she ended up becoming my biggest client. And she found me through a Google search. And that was like, yes, you know, that was like finally victory validation. And, um, and somewhere in that process, I also learned that, oh, you can actually make money from a website. Well, that's kind of cool. So as I'm growing my financial planning practice, I became equally obsessed with how do I grow this website into, you know, kind of like a side hustle side project type thing, making some money and have my first paycheck from my website, which was a Google AdSense check was like 152 bucks. And I was blown away. I was like, yes. And that was like, a couldn't even pay her electricity bill at the time. But uh, that it, it showed me like, oh, like there's something, there's another world out here that I don't know anything about. And it was a battle because I was making really good money as a financial planner, but there was just something about the online side that I just felt like there's something bigger here that I don't quite understand yet. And everything just said, keep going, keep going, keep going. And, you know, fast forward to present day, not to jump too far ahead, but I was a financial planner straight out of college, had did that for 16 years, ended up forming my, my own wealth management firm. I ended up selling a couple of years ago, so I could focus on the blog, the website full time. So it's, it's been a fun ride. But uh, yeah, that that's kind of the journey. And I know I, I fast forward a lot there. But uh, just so to show, people, show people that the, the growth and where it went. Yeah, no, that's all right. I mean, um, what stands out to me about the story is, uh, you didn't necessarily set out to have a side hustle. Like I talk to a lot of people in the career space about like if you're if you're not feeling like you have a creative outlet uh, in your current job, start a side hustle. Like you can find ways to engineer creativity through doing something like that. You were kind of trying to scratch your own itch in your current business and find a way to stand out and make the flywheel start to turn uh, for your for your current business by staying with your curiosity. And by continuing to kind of, I, I always look at you as like, you're just this learner. <laughs> you're, you learn all the time. Like by sticking with that and being true to it, you said, wow, like I actually might have a chance to do this full time. And so for our audience, like the, the website that we're talking about really is goodfinancialsense.com, which Jeff started um, back in, what was that? 2008, you said <laughs> something like yeah. that. Um, yeah. And, and eventually you got to a point where you had this conundrum. You were, 
like I'm making a good amount of money in my current business, uh, advising clients. And I put a lot of work into that. And now good financial sense is making some money. What do I do? You're at this, you're at this crossroads. Talk to us a little bit about how you decided to eventually go full-time with, uh, with GFC. Yeah. Uh, that transition, that was a hard one. You know, it was like, as I mentioned, like my identity was tied into me being a financial planner. I mean, straight from college doing that and growing it and just having a lot of success with it. And also just the people, I mean, these were real people that I was working with and many people, you know, I had client, I had one client like lost their son, like lost, lost their adult son, other clients, you know, lose their parents and just through a lot, you know, help them from hoping to retire to finally retire in many years into retirement. So it wasn't like these were just numbers, like these were relationships. And I living in the Midwest at the time, Southern Illinois to be exact, I, I always felt like, man, if I stay here, it's gonna be really hard for me to separate. Because nobody, people knew that I had a website. Nobody knew how successful it was. Like no one had any clue. And when I finally kind of like share with people like, hey, you know that this online thing is actually making two to three X more than the brick and mortar business that I've spent twice as long growing. Um, but there's still this fear because it is like this online thing, you know, like could it go away? But one of the first steps I did was I moved. <laughs> My wife and I moved to the Nashville area and there was other reasons why we moved, but uh, you know, the business was one of it. I wanted to see if I could separate myself. I'd already hire like a full-time guy to start like taking care of the clients, like already made that step, but moving was helpful. And I tried to sell a minority stake, you know, to the guy who was running it. He wasn't interested. Still don't understand it. That's okay. His loss. And finally had just, it was like a client situation. It was like no big deal, but it was like just annoying and I already had like my day kind of like scheduled out, like producing some content and do some other stuff. And I had to stop and take care of this client. Um, and I just remember sharing with my wife, I'm like, gosh, like that was so, I don't know. I know it's no big deal, but like, it was just so defeating. Cause like, I, I wanted to be productive and creative and it just zapped like all that energy out of me. And then she finally said like, I think it's time to sell. And this is the same wife that, when I wanted to sell a minority stake, like 30%, like she was freaking out. <laughs> uh, like she would like, oh my gosh, like what happens if, but after she saw like that the online business continued to, to thrive and it was like, it was time. And even when I, I got to the point where I was ready to sell, like I was still scared, you know, I don't know. Like it was just like turning, closing the chapter on a very, just a very fun part of my life, you know, like I just had so much growth, so much success and, you know, fear like, man, am I, am I going to be able to do that over here? Even though I was already doing it. But uh, finally that's what led to me uh, executing the cell. And um, yeah, and that's, it is what it is. It's done. Um, I don't regret it. I do miss some of the relationships. You know, I, the thing I really enjoyed about a financial planner going back to the whole, like being curious, I loved meeting new people and learning what their money journey was. You know, what were all like the, the good money moves they made growing up or all the like the bonehead, stupid money makes that they made, you know, the, the lessons that they learned and what got them to where they were. Like, that's the part I miss the most. I don't miss like talking about the Dow Jones dropping 2% like <laughs> every, every other day with the same person, like broker record type conversations. But uh, yeah. That's I'm glad I did it. All right, we're back for the audience. We took a little break. Jeff had to go pick up his kids, uh, which I know plenty about. Um, and that kind of brings me to a thought on, on balance and work-life balance, which I want to maybe get to it in a minute or so. But uh, during our break, I was thinking about, uh, you, were, you were telling a story about how you were uh, essentially thinking about going full-time with the, with the, the website and maybe getting rid of your practice. But before we got to that part, you, you saw the, you kind of saw the uh, trajectory of good financial sense and you, you had promise there, but you, 
you know, it's not without risk, right? It's not a slam dunk. You had to make some choices and decisions in terms of putting more resources against that, right? Either you with your time and maybe neglecting other things like work-life balance or what have you, or actually spending money to build a team, to build other people that can do that for you. Can you talk a little bit about your thought process there and, and how that essentially went? Because it seemed to all work out for the better. <laughs> yeah. And once again, like I had no entrepreneur, business owner, CEO, like DNA in my blood. Um, just that wasn't part of my vocabulary. So I was always scared to like hire somebody, you know, pay somebody to do something. And I was trying to think back on like what finally was uh, what, what finally pushed me over the edge. And it was actually reading Tim Ferriss's four hour work week. And I became really infatuated with this idea of hiring a virtual assistant. Like this is like, this is before virtual before COVID <laughs> uh, and probably a decade before that, like virtual assistants were like this, this thing that was like, wait, what is that? Like, that sounds cool. And I just remember like he shared a story, like some example in the story about this guy hired somebody to book like his airfare or his airline tickets and his schedule, his dry cleaning and make doctor's appointments and even order like his wife's like anniversary gift, which I, I think he even admitted, like, maybe I went too far with that one. Um, but this whole idea that you could buy your time back um, at a much discounted rate. Cause an example he also used was like, you could hire Filipinos, which, you know, I have Filipino in my DNA. <laughs> um, so I remember like the first time I hired somebody was uh, I hired a Filipino virtual assistant to help out with images on the website, the blog for each blog article. Cause I would spend, I actually, I think I calculated, I would spend about four hours a week trying to find like good images that were not, you know, copyright <laughs> uh, trademark that I could use on my blog posts. And the, the, the idea that, oh, I could pay somebody like $16 a week and I get four hours of my time back. Like, okay, that makes a lot of sense. And, and I just began be becoming more comfortable basically taking tasks that I didn't enjoy doing. Maybe I was good at them, but for the most part, like, I didn't enjoy do, doing them. And also it wasn't like the things that I was doing that were making the money. You know, it was networking. It was content creation, uh, building new relationships. Like that's where the money was being made. Not like trying to find the, a good image for the blog post. And that was a little bit for our work week. Eventually that was a business coaching program that I joined where just recognizing like, I, I, could, I could do all the things or do I wanna focus on the things that I'm really good at, that I'm skilled at, that give me life, give me energy and also pay the bills, you know? So that was, was financial planning. That was meeting new clients, right? Finding new clients. It wasn't scheduling appointments. It wasn't cutting retirement checks out of their IRAs. Um, and with the business or the blog, that was like content creation. It was affiliate partnerships, networking, connecting, uh, recording videos, podcasts, eventually. Like that's where I need to spend the time. Yeah, this is, uh, I mean, a couple of real, couple of things that really stand out to me. And I, I talk to a lot of people about, which is this, this concept of investing in yourself. Um, you're describing it as I, I'm paying somebody else, uh, to do this and sort of buying back my time. Right. Um, you did that in terms of hiring people and, and leveraging people uh, kind of on a step-by-step -step basis. And then you also mentioned a, a business coaching program. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, that was a, a one of the biggest non-traditional investments that I've ever made. And going back to my, when I started off as a financial advisor, a junior broker, like the guy that hired me, he was the most successful producer in the firm. And I do remember in that first couple of years, like he mentioned that he'd hired a business coach and I'm in my twenties. I never even heard of a business coach. Like I just knew though he was very successful <laughs> and 
I, I didn't quite get it, but like I, I made a mental note of like, oh, that's interesting. I don't even know what that means. I don't think I need that right now. And fast forward, whenever I had left, left um, that job, co-founded the new firm, had the blog, I had just reached this point with the business where I was making really good money, but there was just something that was missing. I couldn't quite put a finger on it, like just fulfillment or just satisfaction. Like I was, like I said, I was making over $200,000 a year. I had no reason not to be excited, but there was just something like it just was missing. And I ended up meeting somebody that mentioned this business coaching program. And then I remember this other guy who had hired, you know, a business coach. And there was just something about this program. that I'm like, you know what? I think that's what I need. And back then there was like, I think seven or $8,000 that I signed up for this one year, a year long coaching program that was basically me. I went to this, uh, went to their place like once a quarter. <laughs> so every 90 days uh, I had a follow-up call in between each session. And like, that was it, you know, for the entire year. And had I not, had I not been referred to this program, I don't know if I would have went, it was a lot of money back then, but um what I ended up learning from that was I, what I just described earlier about making sure that I'm spending time doing the things that make me money. Uh, the coaching program is called strategic coach. Dan Sullivan is the founder and he would refer to that as your unique ability. You know, what is your God given talents that give you life, give you energy that doesn't feel like a chore that you could spend hours doing. And most importantly, you get paid very well to do it. And sp just spending a lot of time delegating, removing tasks that just crush your soul, that like suck the life out of you and try to spend more time in your unique ability. And it's not an overnight thing. Like it's a process. Um, like one of the first things I remember was like scheduling an appointment, like, or stop, stop scheduling appointments for my client, like with my clients. Like, why am I doing this? You know, but it was just something that I just did like, oh, it's no big deal. I'll just do that. And we have so many of those things in our lives. Like, oh, it's no big deal. I'll just do that. And, and I'll do that. And I'll do that. Next thing you know, like two, three hours is gone. And you've just, you know, did all these little, little tasks that just eat up your time and your energy that you really, like, that's not what you should be doing. Like if you're the CEO, like I guarantee like Jeff Bezos isn't like scheduling, you know, his appointments, Elon Musk's not scheduling his appointments. Uh, the, just the little things like that. Right. Um, and even like with on the blog, for me, like one of the biggest takeaways, like for the first nine to 12 months, like I was writing, I was writing all the articles. I'm not a very good writer. I'm still not a very good writer. I'm better than I was. But uh, when I was spending like a half a day writing a 800 word article, when a really good writer probably knocked that out in like 45 minutes, but like it just took so much energy to do it. I didn't know any different. And then it became a, oh, I could hire a writer, but yeah, but that writer doesn't know my story. They don't know my thoughts. Like that was what I was kind of trapped with. And then somebody entered, actually it was Dan Sullivan. He, it, what did he say? Like he wrote his first book and he's like, you know, I'm not a good writer, but I'm a good author because I have all the information, the experience that I can share and I can just talk, have that transcribed and then have somebody else who's really good at editing and, and make that into a book or an article um, that shares those ideas. And that was like very life-changing for me. So that began this process of like, oh, I can just call into like my iPhone, record a message, send that off to a transcription service. And then my editor or writer can take that and then turn it into a beautifully written, you know, 2000 word post that would have taken me a month to write that wouldn't be nearly as good <laughs> as that whole process. And just like little things like that began optimizing just my time efficiency. And so I could do that multiple times a day versus like me taking, you know, an entire day to write a blog post that I didn't get done with. Like I could actually do that. If I truly wanted like three or four of those. I could just think about it, kind of outline it, get my thoughts in order, call it in, have it transcribed. I'm done. Right. So a lot of people are probably thinking, well, oh, this is like, this whole concept of buying your time, like that's great for people who have money, but it's like this psychological block. I, I, I deal with this all the time. I think actually the first time I wrote about this, Jeff, it's, it's, sitting on your, it's sitting on your website. 
it's uh, the, the posts are about investing in yourself. And I think I break it down like basically invest in ourselves or spend money you know, to, in terms of an investment in ourselves for three main reasons. One is to make more money. Two is to buy back your time, essentially have more time. And the third is uh, to kind of buy or engineer, you know, just general peace in your life. And um, I think our young audience listening can still employ all of this stuff. Like when you just, it, and, I, and I try to get young people to think about it, like, the, the first thing is what you said around your unique gift, talent, God-given, whatever that may be. And it's not just talent, it's interest. Because you're going to do and be better at the things that you are just naturally inclined to do. And so as a young person, like if you can figure out how to do other things or, or have, have other people do other things or spend money strategically so that you can do more of that, and hone that craft, you're going to be more valuable in the future and you're going to make more money and have more opportunity because of that. And so I just, I think like there's so many times we spend money, right, on random stuff. And it, it, there's this like switch we have to flip in terms of thinking about investing in ourselves different than spending money and, and every investment decision being different than the, the act of spending money because you're clearly like an example of you had this, I'm sorry, I'm going on a rant here, but like <laughs> you had this, um, you know, natural inclination to kind of nose the grindstone, do everything right yourself. And you kind of at, at some point picked your head up and looked out a little bit, saw the forest through the trees and said, you know, you were curious and you got help. Um, and then you said, there are people that can do this better than me. And I'm going to, see leaps and bounds of growth because of that. So even, even just spending the idea of spending $7,000 on a coaching program, right? Like there's not that many people that really do that, but you recognize and you're humble enough to say like, I need help here. And I think this $7,000 is going to be way better spent in my growth than spending $7,000 on, you know, whatever, you know, God knows what we could spend our money on. And I, so I just see that in you, I guess. It's more of a comment. And, I, and I'm just trying to relate it to our audience. Like, I just think that there's this, I don't know how we get over this psychological block of thinking about spending money on ourselves as an investment versus uh, just spend. But I think that's like critical for young people in terms of growing. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's hard, right? I mean, it's like, gosh, what, I'm, not, I'm not ready to hire, you know, join a coaching program, you know, but it could be, paying buying a course it could be hiring a coach it could be uh hiring a mentor joining like a private mastermind group uh i mean there are many different ways that you can invest in yourself and the ones i'm sharing with you are the ones that worked out <laughs> there are plenty that didn't um but you know like you said earlier like i i have been naturally curious and as long as i didn't put my family in a financial bind where you know like we had to sell the house and uh <laughs> like that would be a bad idea um but i was always willing you know to test out a few things um but i guess another thing that i could also share was I mean, you met, mentioned the strength finders like that's a, i think a great test and uh, i i was more into the colby index which just measure like my person my personality type and uh, that was also very eye-opening for me because I recognized with that, you take this test, it gives you four numbers. And one's like, are you a quick start? Are you a high researcher? Do you like to build things? I forgot the, the term. Um, and then are you a good implementer or follow through? Excuse me, follow through. And I suck at follow through. Uh, I like to research a lot and I'm a, a big idea guy. So I get really excited about the idea, but when it came, comes to like follow through or actually imp implementing that idea, I'm not very good. <laughs> Cause when it times I actually like start to do the things, if, if I'm truly passionate about it, or if I just recognize like, man, if, once I do this, like it's going to be good. Cause obviously I did it with a blog. I had no idea what I was doing, but uh, I, I'm more excited about the idea. If I need to roll up my sleeves, I'll get it done. But on a lot of these things, when I would get stuck, like great idea, 
Ooh, crap. That's just like a lot of work. Okay. I'll, I'll put that off till later. And, or, Hey, let me, let me hire somebody. Let me find somebody that's really good at taking an idea and executing on it. Like that's like the perfect marriage, the perfect partnership. And once I understood my personality type and how I was easily excitable, it also, I was also able to learn like, Oh, that's great. I have a lot of good ideas. But remember, we need to execute on a few of these. So it might be a great idea. It just doesn't mean that's a great idea right now. It might be something we can visit later on. So a lot of just understanding how you're wired, uh, I think is also important. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So when you were building the team, was it was it primarily building for to fuel growth? Or was it more so building to for the for the time aspect? I mean, you you have how many kids do you have now? F- five? Four. four. Yeah, we got four. four. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to add um, one. There. But like, yeah. you know, that's obviously coming into the picture. I think about that all the time, right? Like, am I trying to build a maximally hyper growth company? Or, you know, am I trying to engineer the best work life that I can that I can do? Like, what were your thoughts at the time? Um, I think it was a little bit of both. You know, it was, I, I had ambi- ambitions of growing but this idea that I could buy back my time and just have freedom of time was very exciting. Um, I remember one of the first things after joining this coaching program, I scheduled it in the summer. I scheduled to take my kids, my family to the St. Louis zoo, like on a Wednesday, like during the day. And I had so much anxiety (laughs) about doing that because I just didn't do that. Like what? I mean, I, I would take vac- a vacation, but to take a day off in the middle of the week and the instructions I gave my assistant at the time was like, hey, if this is an emergency, you can call me. If it's not, don't bother me. <laughs> you know, I'll get to it when I get back the next day. And I just like, it's just like this belief, like, oh my gosh, like if I'm not available, like my business is going to crumble. It's going to you know, client's going to call and I'm not there. I'm at the zoo with my family. Oh my gosh. Like what's going to happen. And guess what? Nothing happened. Nothing happened. Um, fast forward a couple of years, like we ended up taking a two week RV trip, which once again, instructions were I'm on vacation, unless it's an A client that needs, needs me, then, you know, that I'll make an exception. And I think while I was gone, I talked to one client who was an A client and I was talking to him while I was driving the RV. <laughs> <laughs> um, and like, that was just unheard of. Like, you know, in a really good book that I'm, I've, I'm familiar with the concepts. I think it just came out. It's um, who, uh, who, not how, I think is the name. And there's also another one. It's this whole who concept. And what I finally recognized was when you stop asking, how do I do that? Or I don't know how to do that. I don't even know how to get started. It's like, you don't have a how problem. You have a who problem. Like, who do you need to talk to? You know, who, who's someone in your network that you can reach out to that can maybe connect you to the right person? And, and that's something like I still work on. I mean, I still struggle at times. Like, and I recognize like, oh, it's not, how do I do this? It's like, who do I need? You know, who do I need on my team? Who do I need to hire? Who do I need to talk to? that's going to educate me on this thing that has been sucking the very, very strong, the whole sucking term, um, sucking the life out of me. And that, so it's just, once again, it's the, who do I need that's going to help me stay in my unique ability? Unique ability. Yep. So you've, you know, you've worked this, you've kind of worked this normal job. You've turned a, essentially a side hustle into a very successful business that allowed you to kind of step out of your role as a financial advisor into CEO leader of a, you know, an online internet company, which you continue to work at today. Like what is a, what does the future hold for you? What are you, what do you want to do, I guess, with specifically like your career and your work um, moving forward? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I, I was used to be very motivated by 
ambitious goals and numbers and growth and all this stuff. And, and that's great. I mean, I think that's having some sort of target to shoot for, I think is, is important. Um, and just because behind the scenes, like there's been uh, some shakeups with the business and uh, had a, a business partnership that didn't end on the greatest of terms. So it's really kind of put me back into reassessing what is like the long-term vision? Like what are the long-term goals? And for me, I don't think I've, I've shared any of this. I started the, the blog as a marketing tool for the practice. But underneath that was this deep desire to truly serve people. And serve people because with my upbringing, having, and I didn't mention this, both my parents, you know, they were divorced when I was young. Both of them struggled financially. They both filed bankruptcy twice, independent of each other. Um, and like, that's what I grew up with financially. Like those are the financial lessons that were passed down to me. And when I finally got to that point, when I saw my, my parents were who they were and realized like, Ooh, I don't want to become them and struggle with money the rest of my life. Like, what can I do differently? And once I started making those choices, you know, joining the guard and going to school, college and paying off all my debt, uh, becoming a financial advisor, then it became this, how can I show other people not to become like what my parents became, what I was on the path to becoming. And it was like this deep desire to share my experience, you know, my expertise in helping people not, I, not make the stupid boneheaded decision that I made and help them start taking charge of their financial future. And so right now, like that's the vision, like that's the goal is like, how can I serve as many people as I possibly can every single day? Um, and that could be my business. It could be my wife. It could be my family. But as far as like the business, it's like, I want to serve people. And how do I do that? I create content that I think is going to help people. It's going to impact people. Um, I just, you know, I think it was something the other day I shared something and I think it was like just sharing. I don't remember what it was exactly, but I remember I had a reader comment and they shared with me that they had read like one of my Roth IRA posts from, 10 years ago. And after reading that post, they started a Roth IRA. They started investing. And now like they had over a couple hundred thousand dollars in their tax-free retirement account in their Roth. And it's like, awesome. Like, because of something that I did, I mean, they still had to do the work, right? They still had to actually open up the account, start investing, stay disciplined, continue to invest. Like they still had to do that, but you know, something that I did years ago gave them that catalyst to go out and do it and literally change their life forever and impact them and impact the ones around them and hopefully their kids and their kids' kids. And like that's the stuff that going back to you know why I kept blogging when I didn't really quite understand what it was, like when I when I knew that there was something bigger than me here, like that's I'm still there. Like there's still something bigger than than me here that I can fully comprehend. Um, maybe I won't have the reach of Dave Ramsey and other, you know, financial authors and radio guys, but that's okay. Uh, you know, I still can reach millions, you know, especially nowadays with YouTube and podcasts and everything else. I mean, it's just, it's just crazy. Right. And so when I can help people and make a really good living on top of that, like that's, <laughs> does it really get any better than that? Yeah, I love that. And I think you're, you've always been true to that, which is fantastic. Um, you brought up YouTube and something that's been on my mind is like, you know, there's, there's all these um, social media outlets, right? And I'm, I've always been a behind the scenes guy. I'm not, I'm not super huge on, on these things, but in terms of like developing an audience and all that kind of stuff, like what are, what, are, what do you think are some of the keys to cracking into uh, you know, these platforms? Like obviously you're, you're, you've done well, but there's a lot of quote unquote, uh, and I don't, I don't include you in this category, quote, quote unquote, financial experts on TikTok even, and, and all these places that are, you know, building businesses, it's, it's hard to cut through. What do you think, like, what are the keys to doing some of that? Yeah. I mean, with a lot of these platforms, I mean, it, it's, it gets easy to get caught up in comparison syndrome. You know, like you look at all these other creators out there and you're like, oh my gosh, how do I ever compete? So oftentimes it's easy to take the shortcut approach. So what does that mean? That means that you are either, maybe you're stealing somebody else's ideas or you are 
making yourself to be something that you're really not. Maybe you're just making up stories. <laughs> um, like I've seen like this one guy on YouTube, like build up a huge Dogecoin following and he just kept putting all these like crappy Dogecoin video. This is, this is before like Elon was like on Saturday Night Live, but all like these price predictions, you know, and, and because it was so hot, everybody was talking about it. I mean, he's getting 10, 20, 30, 40,000 views per video, which I'm sure he's making decent money, you know, like in his twenties. But when, after a while, when you realize he has no idea what he's talking about. <laughs> and again, I was following him on Twitter and I just see all these people like calling him out. Like, like, dude, you've been saying this for like six months. Like you're not, you're saying the same thing over and over again. Like eventually like people will catch on. Um, so it, it's, it's, it is be willing to be yourself, be authentic, be willing to test things out, but also being consistent. Because if I would have stopped after a year or two and just gave up, you know, I wouldn't be where I'm at and just continue to show up provide value. Uh, and I think that's, that's a big part of it. Now, we could talk about quality of content, um, you know, editing and, and other things, but that's getting more into the weeds. But I think at the end of the day, it's just like, it's just showing up providing value. You know, how can you really serve people? And there's, there's marketing, there's networking, there's a lot of different aspects of business also related into all of that. Um, but I see a lot of the guys that continue to do it is that they just continue to show up, you know, be authentic, be their, their, their real self. Authenticity, consistency seem to be the two, like just biggest ones, mm -hmm. just sheer will of continuing to create content and being yourself and in that. Um, what's the, uh, what's the best investment you've ever made that can be, you know, I'm obviously financial in a stock or, or like we've talked about uh, previously or earlier investing in yourself. What, what do you think of the number one decision you've made that's had the biggest payoff is? Man. Um, bom, bom, bom. <laughs> Gosh, there's like, um, like the CFP designation, there was the coaching program. There was starting in my own wealth management firm going completely on my own. Um, wow. Um, I think honestly, looking back, the best investment was choose a buying, buying Rich Dad Poor Dad. Um, book. Yeah, it was a book. Choosing yeah. to read a book. I mean, back then it was probably like 12 bucks. But that was the book that I read that started the process of changing the way that I think. You know, recognizing that, oh, this is... You're, he's talking about things that my dad never talked about that I've never even heard discussed among my peer group. There's something here. I don't know what it is, but I'm interested to learn more about it. And that, that really started that journey of, you know, they kind of just started scratch the itch a little bit, but starting to do a lot of digging that ended up leading to all these other investments that I've mentioned before. Um, but I, you know, not just reading the book, but choosing to accept that there's another reality out there <laughs> that you might not fully understand yet. But, you know, everything that you've heard from your parents or your grandparents or whomever you run around with, accept the fact that they might not know it all. And there's other things out there that exist that could lead to something a whole lot better. Uh, that's just mind blowing to me, right? You think you talk about spending 12 bucks. <laughs> And it's something that's completely changed your life. And all the other ones too, that you rattled off were all investments in yourself. Not one of them. And, and you're a financial advisor, right? You're a financial planner. Not one of them was I bought Apple <laughs> stock or, or whatever it is, right? It was all about framing your mind and, and then continuing to bet on yourself and invest money and time and effort into, into, yourself. And for most people, right? Like our number one, our biggest asset is our ability to earn a dollar over, over a lifetime. Right. So it makes sense to invest in your ability to continue to do those things and to, and to be better and better at, at doing them as opposed to, you know, whatever, like whatever hot stock, whatever Dogecoin, uh, you know, type, uh, type investment. Like it just, it makes, it makes sense. And we need to be able to, as a, as a population, need to be able to get over some of these psychological hurdles for us to accept that. 
right? Mm -hmm. That investing yeah. in ourselves is, is the most important thing that we can possibly do. Absolutely. Um, what do you think is the best, the, the biggest takeaway or lesson from your experiences that you've talked about today and, and just over your life as you've gone and done a number of different things and kind of come full circle with it? What was the question again? What was the best? What do you, and, I, and I'd like to share mine um, after, after you go, but what do you think is the biggest takeaway or lesson out of your experience and what you've shared with us today? Yeah. Um, be, be willing to test things out. Be willing. I mean, you know, fail. You hear that a lot. And I mean, there were so many times like I quote unquote failed. And the way that I looked at it as, and I, and I go back to cold calling. I feel like cold calling was what really kind of gave me, I guess that uh, the ability to do that because, you know, cold calling is horrible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And the idea was like, you'd make a hundred dials. And if you made a hundred dials, you may talk to 20 people. Uh, and one of those might become a client. And so think about how many times I was rejected, <laughs> making all these calls, getting hung up on yelled at whatever. Um, but what I, I remember hearing was every no is going to get me closer to a yes. And I just took that same philosophy and applied that to testing out different business ideas, uh, business growth ideas within the business. It's like, Ooh, this sounds, this sounds fun. Let me try this. Oh, crap. That didn't work. Okay. Well, do I need to tweak something here or is that just an entirely bad idea? And then like test something else out and just to always be testing, always willing to try out new things and not letting each quote unquote failure derail me and say, oh, no, that, that ain't gonna work. Yeah, that was a waste of time, you suck. Like no point doing that again. I mean, like I had so many different things I, I would try out that just didn't quite work out, but every single no ended up leading me closer to that, that yes. Yeah, I love that. And I think from, from my perspective, having known you for a while, the, the takeaway from your entire story is you don't have to have a plan, you know, set from a, from a young age. I think a lot of people just think that, oh my God, you know, I'm going to go to college and then I need to know what I'm going to do. And it's like, that's not true. Life is experienced. It's lived. It's not preordained. Um, and by being open and keeping an open mind um, and being willing to be willing to do things and try things, you can intuit your way there. You can, you can be a wayfinder and, and find your path. It doesn't have to be thought ahead of time. And I, I mean, I feel that way about my career. So maybe I'm a little bit biased, but um, I'm trying to encourage people to let that go a little bit. Stop thinking, start doing um, type of a mentality. And so I appreciate you coming and sharing your, your entire story. It's inspirational. I love it. Um, I really appreciate having you, uh, as a, as a friend and, and as a, as a colleague. And so thank you so much for doing this. Um, where can people find more about you? You're all over the place. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you can boil it down and give it, you know, we'll make sure we have links to all the show notes where people can find you on all of the YouTube and, and everywhere you're at, but where can people find, find more about you? Yeah. Uh, goodfinancialsense.com that you've mentioned uh, throughout the show. That's uh, the, the blog also on YouTube. You can uh, search, actually I've got two YouTube channels now. I've got the wealth hacker, which is more about um, just accelerated wealth building uh, we also have a uh, corresponding Good Financial Sense YouTube channel now. Uh, there's also the Good Financial Sense podcast. And as far as like social media, I think I'm most active on Twitter. You can find me at J Jeff Rose on Twitter and same handle on Instagram if you want to go there. But uh, yeah, at J Jeff Rose on Twitter. Awesome. Jeff, anything else that I may have missed or not covered that, you, uh, that you'd that you like to leave our audience with? Mm, gosh, this is my post like just like have that truth bomb, right? Um, <laughs> no, just, you know, like, just continue to just to believe in yourself and and try out new things. And if that means like, just being brave enough to ask somebody to lunch, to coffee, 
because you want to learn more about them and you just really it's just like you admire them for what they've accomplished uh don't use the phrase i want to pick your brain i feel like that is that's just the worst phrase to use and just trust me on that one but if you lead in with like hey i'd really admire you for what you have achieved and i would love to learn more about what led to your success could i get you know some 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 of your time for a cup of coffee or lunch you know to learn more about your success like that sounds a whole hell lot better than i want to pick your brain um, which implies that you want something for free. That's that's why. So yeah, that that would be my last parting out of wisdom. Excellent. Well, I really I really appreciate you being here. I've enjoyed this. I think we should probably do it again uh, at some point. Sounds great. <laughs> All right, Jeff. Have a great uh, rest of your evening. Go enjoy that family. I will. Thank you. All right, man.